we have looked now at tribal religions using the African experience as a case study, an example. We have also looked at a national religious system, namely Hinduism. And we've seen how particularly the churches and the Muslim community have pressed that Hindu understanding, which is what the BJP would be about, uh, to urge that India not become a Hindu state, a Hindu nation, but a secular state. But we've seen how a Hindu state would function uh, as, uh, within, within that Hindu-Indian experience. So we've looked at Hinduism as a national religion in India. I want to take one more example, not long, but just briefly, take one more example of, of, uh, a, a, of, a, of a national system becoming uh, and, and being, being a religious, being a religious uh, uh, phenomenon. In other words, uh, a religion as a national system. And namely, I'm thinking about Shintoism in Japan. And the reason I'm uh, mentioning this briefly is because uh, it keeps coming up almost every year in our news in one way or another, the Shinto religion of Japan. And Shintoism really means um, divine. Shin is, means divine. To, way. Shinto, divine way. That's what it means. Shinto, Shinto. Now, what is this divine way? The divine way is the way of the kami. Please explain to me what is this kami that you Shintoists are always talking about. It's the way. Well, please explain it to me. I told you, it's the way. <laughs> kami cannot be explained. It's early in this class, we talked about religions relating to the mysterium. Uh, I think that's the best way to attempt to express what Kami is about. It's the mysterium. It is that other area, that other region of life that we can't see, we can't feel, but we sense it's there. Uh, what it's all about, we don't know. That's Kami. And so Shintoism is the way of the Kami. And there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of kami. Uh, I suppose in African traditional religion, they may express these kami as being spirits. Uh, but that is too restrictive, the Japanese would say. Yes, it's spirits, but it's, every, it's, all, it's all the mysterious phenomenon that whirls around us, that is present around us, and so forth and so forth. Um, it's the way of the kami. That's, that's what it is. Now. How did the kami come to be? Well, there was the sun god called Amaterasu. Amaterasu, the sun god. And then there is that other god called Amatsu. So Amaterasu and Amatsu are two divinities. They began to produce children, this uh, male god and female goddess, Amaterasu and Amatasu, producing children. These children are kami. They produce millions of kami, this god and goddess, producing, producing, producing. And um, uh, they also got involved uh, on the earth. These kami would descend to earth, and sometimes Amaterasu and Amatasu and Amatsu would come to, to earth, and as they would come to earth, they would bring with them mud and so forth and so forth. And so in due course, these kami consorts of Amaterasu uh, and, and, and his wife, her, uh, and her wife, would, uh, would start to uh, uh, multiply the islands of Japan as well, and so forth. And so all phenomenon on earth came forth, all the kami came forth, and all the phenomena on earth came forth through this Amaterasu and Amatsu. 
including the seven major islands of Japan. And then, in due course, why um, they produced a son, a human son, who is a descendant of these divine beings. And this son becomes the emperor of Japan. And so the emperor of Japan, called Meiji, the ancient emperor of Japan called Meiji, is the son of this Amaterasu, the sun goddess. And um, so in time, the myth begins to say that Japan is ruled by a divine descendant of the sun god, and also that the islands of Japan are the descendant of the sun, sun god, and, and also that the, all the phenomena in Japan and all the people in Japan are descendant of, the, of Amaterasu. The sun, the sun goddess. So it becomes a divine phenomenon. Now, here's where the critical question comes as it relates to the modern world. What does that mean for Japan's relationship with other nations? If the Japanese people, the Japanese islands, and the, um, and the, um, uh, the people and the islands uh, and uh, the uh, sea around them, uh, and the emperor are all divine. What does that mean? Let me quote here from this book called Global Gods, which is my text for this course. This means that the phenomenal world is Mikado's land, this Meiji dynasty belongs to Mikado. From this center, we must expand this great spirit throughout the world. The expansion of Great Japan throughout the world and the elevation of the entire world into the land of the gods is the urgent business of the present, and again, it is our eternal and unchanging object. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What's happening here? We're reading here that not only is Japan divine and the emperor the descendant of Amaterasu and Amatsu. But we're reading that the Japanese people and emperor have a mission. To do what? To expand the Japanese nation to the whole world. You see? So that's the myth that began to be embraced by the Japanese people. It probably partly happened because of an attempt to resist Western colonial expansionism into Japan, uh, try to defend themselves against that. Hey, you know what? We're divine and we're going to take you on if you're not careful. That kind of spirit began to enter the culture, but it's rooted in this Shinto myth that we're talking about, you see. So here's a religion, a religious uh, development, uh, which moves not just from saying that these kami that are produced by Amaterasu and Amatsu, that these kami are the islands and so forth, but it moves now to say the emperor is a descendant of these divinities, and not only is the emperor descendant, but that he has a mission with the Japanese people to extend the Japanese empire to the ends of the earth. And that's exactly what happened. That's what World War II was, as far as the Japanese participation in it that they saw their mission was to extend the Japanese empire throughout all of Asia and to the regions beyond. That's why they bombed Pearl Harbor, the U.S. Uh, uh, islands out there, Pearl Harbor, you know. It's why they moved into, into uh, uh, Indonesia and on into uh, Philippines and so forth in World War II. It became a very expansionist empire rooted in a theology, in a religiosity, which condoned what they were doing because they are really uh, the uh, the really divine progeny, the sons and daughters of uh, of divinity. In the war, in due course, 
Japan was defeated. And when Japan was defeated, the uh, Allied powers, the US and, and the powers fighting with the US, demanded that the emperor declare that he is not God. They had a public ceremony where he signed documents declaring that he is not divine, that he is not the descendant of this divine pair, Amaterasu and Amatsu. He is not their progeny, their descendant. He is not divinity. Now just try to imagine the philosophical and theological and religious turmoil, transformation that something like that brings about. I mean, here the Japanese people have laid down their lives fighting for their emperor whom they believe was God. I mean, thousands and thousands died fighting for this emperor. And now he goes to the podium and he signs a statement and announces publicly for the whole nation to hear, I am not a god. We abandon that belief, absolutely. We abandon it. Of course, with the Allied military forces standing there with him to insist that he make that confession. This is an example of what we call a major paradigm revolution, a major meta-narrative revolution, because it is to say the old meta-narrative does not fit and is not accepted. So that's the change that took place. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. Now, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that Shintoism has died. All across Japan, you have these Shinto shrines, something like 100,000 of them, where people will go and do their obeisance. It's all linked up with ancestor veneration, all that kind of thing. So the emperor declaring that he's not divine does not mean that Shintoism is finished. Uh, the Shinto notion, the way of the kami, and the veneration of these kami and so forth continues. And the annual pilgrimages to a whole variety of Shinto shrines across the country uh, continues. People go on these pilgrimages. It becomes a great big family festival getting together. And, and uh, I won't take time to go into the various festivals. But in various ways, they all have to do with cleanliness and getting your sins um, uh, dealt with and washed away in, in the rivers of Japan and so forth, you know. It's that sort of thing that goes on in these, uh, in these variety of, uh, of, Shint of Shinto ceremonies and pilgrimages and so forth. It's still very much a part of Japanese life. The thing, however, that causes dismay by the surrounding countries is that in recent years, Japanese prime ministers have gone to the Shinto Shrine of the War Dead in Tokyo. This is a shrine built in memory of those who died in World War II, fighting for the emperor who is divine. And in recent years, okay, several times this has happened, where the prime minister goes with multitudes of others who lost loved ones and so forth in the war, goes with them to this shrine of the war dead. Now, why would it be that when that happens, as happened not so long ago, you would have huge um, uh, gatherings in Beijing, China, for example, protesting that the, that the Prime Minister has gone to the Shrine of the War Dead. Why would the Chinese in Beijing, many miles away from Japan, be so upset about this? Well, 
it's a reminder of World War II and what happened there. And the concern that if the emperor begins to open the door to a veneration of the war dead, it could open the door towards a reinstatement of this kind of theology that led Japan into World War II. That's the concern. That's the concern. Not only has the prime minister gone to the shrine of the war dead, but uh, there's other shrines as well, which the Japanese people take part in, uh, the shrine of the nation and so forth. There's not so much concern about that, however. The concern is this pilgrimage occasionally to the shrine of the war dead. And so here you would have an example of a national religious system which has brought disaster and the desire of a people to turn away from that disaster to reconstruct the religious paradigm in a way which fits in the modern world, but a perplexity as how to do appropriate recognition of the sacrifice of the many, many who died fighting for Japan to recognize what they have done uh, in a respectful way um, without kindling anew the patriotic fervor that brought Japan into World War, into World War uh, II. So that's the, that's the dilemma. And so in the newspapers and so forth, when you read about uh, the occasion about this prime minister heading out there to the tomb of the war dead and how that uh, in Korea or in Singapore, wherever there has been demonstrations opposing, objecting to this, you understand why. It's that, it's that sort of concern, yeah.